Thank you very much. A little louder, please. This is a complex problem. It's called a disaster. Look up the meeting and the roof of a disaster. Friday, September 2nd, four days after Katrina hit, the cavalry has arrived. Hey, let us down! Let us down, Dad! Uh, all I have to say this morning is, uh, hooray for Honoré. This guy uh, seems to be the perfect guy for this job. Seeing him in the streets of New Orleans, telling them to put their M16s down, for gosh sakes. And, you know, just, you know, let's get some tension out of here. Let a little steam off, please. You know, you saw Honoré yesterday doing really sort of almost symbolic things, but uh, at one point, our Barbara Starr, who was uh, right along there with him, uh, witnessed him come up to a mother who had twin uh, babies and she was struggling to even hold on to them. He took the babies out of her arms, uh, gave them to his soldiers, and arranged for them to immediately be medevac uh, to a ship offshore. Now, that's just one person, but what it, it sends a message that they understand uh, the problem. Of course, the whole, his whole point about having the soldiers put their guns down, uh, to again, reinforce that they're here to help. They're not here to, uh, you know, intimidate people. Well, I'll tell you where blame doesn't lie, and that's where the straight shoot and take charge John Wayne dude who never got stuck on stupid. He was exactly what the Gulf Coast needed right after Hurricane Katrina. Don't get stuck on stupid, reporters. That's BS. I will take that on behalf of every first responder down there. It's BS. That's right. We'll never forget General Russell Honore's one-liners, but we'll remember what he did for the hurricane victims even more. When President Bush assigned this Louisiana-born general to command Joint Task Force Katrina, Honore knew this would be one of the most difficult missions in his career, but he was ready. He became an overnight hero. Charlie. Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, well, good morning. It's great to be here. It's an honor to be here. This is about my third or fourth opportunity to come to this great institution to speak over the years. I had the opportunity to live in this town for almost six years. Uh, little known to many of you, I commanded an outfit called the 1st United States Army. I was the 33rd commander. The first commander was a guy named Black Jack Pershing, and uh, in World War II, commanded by a guy by the name of Omar Bradley. So uh, you wouldn't know about me in that lineup, but, but it's great to be here today. I uh, probably didn't have the grades to come to Georgia Tech, but I had a lot of Georgia Tech grads work for me <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and it's uh, great to be here. It's a deep esteem honor, and uh, I see our future officer course sitting over here. I thank you all for coming and uh, recognize a few veterans in the audience. Uh, I want to talk to you today about leadership and preparedness in the 21st century. The thing about preparedness is it's... Uh, uh, talked about after things happen, of what we could have done, should have done, and uh, we kind of lose our place sometime with an understanding of what happens and how they happen, and we, we get this idea that we can control everything. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to get over it. We cannot control everything. Is a level of preparedness because regardless of what we do and what we build as human beings, on any given day, Mother Nature can break it. It's absolute break it. And our uh, uh, continuous struggle is how we can beat Mother Nature uh, at her game, if I may use that as a metaphor. On any given day, Mother Nature can break anything built by man. Uh, just this past year, Mother Nature came through here with a little cold weather and some ice and took one of America's greatest cities and did what? Shut it down. Just shut it down. Now, there are things we can do that uh, can prevent the impact of Mother Nature work. We can start off by doing simple things like listen to the weatherman. Because we understand in my 37 years, three months, and three days in the military that hope is not a method. <laughs> uh, hoping that it will go north of us or go south of us is not, should not be a method of doing business when you've got a metropolitan area of six to seven million people. 
uh, and you've got trucks and airplanes coming in from all directions. I say this not as a criticism, but as an observation. There are many things that cause that paralysis in decision making before, during, and after an event that goes deep into the history of this state and many other states. Nobody intentionally woke up this morning and said, we're going to screw this up. We just many times failed to act, as was the case in uh, Katrina. Uh, but uh, talking about preparedness kind of reminds me of a story. I do get to go around and talk about leadership around the country. I was in Houston a couple of years ago uh, talking at a dog food convention. And uh, it was an interesting audience. I mean, I've talked to fence conventions and toilet maker conventions and water maker conventions and engineers. Uh, the esteemed design, bill, architect and engineer convention, national convention, spoke at all those. But this, speaking of this dog food convention, kind of remind me of what I'm trying to sell to you today about preparedness. Uh, we went into this session, a uh, big old audience kind of looked like the opening of a Garth Brook concert. Music playing, smoke coming out of the floor, the CEO come across the stage and everybody stand up and it's like a rock star. And uh, I need you to participate for this thing to get the effect. So I'm going to change the name of the dog food company and I'm going to play the role of the CEO for a minute. And he comes across and everybody quiet down and all the troops are clapping, boy, and he gets him quiet down. He says, uh, the name of this dog food company we're going to use is ABC. You with me? Y'all got the theme. Y'all smart people. Okay, y'all explain it to the Marines, because uh, they'll get it in the second time around. <laughs> so, he asks, best Marine Corps in the world. There's one in the room. There's always one. So, <laughs> he asks a question. He says, uh, and we'll call it the ABC Dog Food Company, okay? He said, who has the best dog food? ABC. Who has the best price? ABC. And boy, then the next question he asks, who has the safest dog food? And everybody pulled a piece of dog food out they had given them, and they popped it in their mouth. I said, damn. <laughs> this guy got these people fired up. <laughs> and then he does what most CEOs do. He threw the slide up and showed the income stream, the return on investment. And ladies and gentlemen, that thing was flatlined. It wasn't going anywhere. It hadn't been anywhere. It was a loser. And I say to myself, I'm glad I got my damn check before I got here. <laughs> uh, and of course, he would do what any CEO would say. He said, OK, now what's the problem? And there was silence. The smoke went down. The lights came up. Because he was looking for dialogue with the troops. Why wasn't this thing selling? He got the best marketplace, the best, safest food, the best price, the best looking dog food bag. They got everything. It's not selling. So after his third time yelling at the audience, a dude in the back put his hand up. He said, who is that? He said, boss, this is uh, Bubba from Lake Charles, Louisiana. He said, Bubba, what's the problem, Bubba? Bubba said, boss, the problem is the damn dogs won't eat it. <laughs> In your management school, they would call that organization alignment or some BS. <laughs> Our problem with disaster preparedness is that people won't eat it. And most people in Georgia spend more time getting ready for football season than they do getting ready for winter. And the same thing can be said in New Orleans. People spend more time getting ready for LSU and Tulane games and Saints game than they do getting ready for hurricane season when we know they're going to come and they could have disastrous impact. Uh, the situation as we saw unfold in New Orleans, we had two things come together, the power of Mother Nature against a city of about a half a million people and the storm won. It broke the levees around a city that is below a sea level. Uh, it flooded two, uh, our two largest hospitals. Now, to you engineers and architects, uh, some of this stupid come y'all way. Uh, because everybody will remember the name of the mayor, but nobody remember the name of the architect and the engineer 
who decided to put the generator and the power system in the basement of the charity hospital. Now, who in the hell would do that? Hello. <laughs> and when you go back and you ask the question, you say, well, who decided to do that? And you go see the architects. The architects say, it wasn't us. The engineers wanted it there. You go see the engineers and say, well, I just want to tell you, we know better. It's the damn CFO decided to put it there. <laughs> <laughs> it was about money. We lost those two hospitals. Uh, next year, we hope to have those two hospitals open at a cost of $1.3 billion apiece. Those hospitals could have went well into this century and beyond, like we do with buildings around here, reshape, remodel, rearm. But uh, we lost them both because the generator was in the basement, all the mechanics was in the basement, and also the computers were in the basement. Because it's cool down there. And you know, the computer guys, they don't want to be carrying that shit all the way upstairs. You know, they want, <laughs> they want to go down there with the generator guy and hang out in that cool, dark spot in the bottom. Computers run good. We lost it all. We ran that city for a couple months while I was there on yellow ledger pads. Until they got new computers in and got people working. So that's the impact that you can have in America. You saw it here in Atlanta if you were living here, and you can reflect back from the video on what happened in New Orleans. Uh, Mother Nature, the impact of Mother Nature. You saw it in one of the most prepared places in the world, have a catastrophic event in Japan. Some of the most prepared um, communities in, in the world. And uh, again, they were overmatched. They went from a natural disaster known as a tsunami to a man-made disaster called a nuclear power plant. Now, who in the hell will put a nuclear power plant uh, on the water? You would if you are from Japan or you from Korea, where the concept of ground is very precious. And somebody come convince you, hey, you want one of these nuclear power plants. Oh, well, let's get four of them. Because what goes on the high ground in uh, many Asian countries? Who goes on the high ground? Papasan. I mean, you know that culture. You go there and you'll see a little mound on, uh, you'll see a little hill, and on top of that hill is a significant person from that community. So it speaks to the part of how our cultural norms can override engineering decisions to all you engineers. In New Orleans, where do we put the engineer, where do we put the generators? In the basement. In the city, everybody knew it was going to flood at some point in time. In Japan, and this is not uh, anything against the, the, the actual personalities. These things happen over time. They put the, the nuclear reactors where they took water on high tide. And that surge. Now, if you had to walk that dog back, would you do that? Probably not. We're rebuilding the hospitals in New Orleans. Guess what? The first floor is what I call the dummy floor. You know, it's nothing. You can park cars there. You can put stuff there. But all of the technology is at least 12 feet off the ground. In Japan, if they had moved it two lengths of the Georgia Tech football field, it would have never gotten wet. And they wouldn't have gone from a, a natural disaster to a man-made disaster. So y'all being one of the big brains outfit of this kind of, this discipline, uh, you ought to have an appreciation of what Mother Nature can do when you design and build this great building. Now go around the world, uh, if you look in there in that deck, you'll see a map of the United States. Would you pull that up for me? And your name again? Charlie. Charlie. Charlie is my new best friend. You'll see a map in there, Charlie. Bring that map up. Well, since you're going to do that, Charlie, keep going. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Faster, Charlie. <laughs> You'll see a map right there, Charlie. To those of you that are geographically challenged, this here's a map of the United States of America. <laughs> that big red thing in the middle is the Mississippi River. We talk about floods. Floods destroy more homes every year than any other event in the world. The power of water. 
Uh, a couple years after I retired, I was doing a little analyst work over at CNN headquarters. There was a flood out in the Midwest. Won't mention the name of the town, but the last name of the town is Falls. And I was talking to a professor there, uh, whom I had met uh, sometime after Katrina. And he said, well, General, I just don't understand how it flooded here. I said, well, Professor, at your university, I'm looking at the Google map, there's a river run through it. I said, what do you look, see when you see, look to the east, Professor? He said, I see high ground. What do you see when you look to the west, Professor? He said, I see high ground. I said, that's a damn valley. <laughs> You're standing next to a river. How do you think they got there, Professor? He said, well, it never flooded here before. I said, not in your lifetime, obviously. But it flooded there at some point in time. And I go to these national flood conferences and these state uh, emergency managers say, well, General, what's a good way to figure out if, if it might flood? I say, number one rule, if you live in a house and you can see water, it can flood. <laughs> Damn. If you cross water on the way home, you probably live in a place that could flood. It, it's not that sophisticated. You do not need a model. And if this is your first home, and you're taking a loan out, and you go to the bank, and you're getting ready to close on the house, and could that, they say, uh, you're going to have to go see FEMA about your flood insurance. You better get the hell out of there. Because <laughs> you're about to buy a house in a flood zone. It is not very sophisticated. Our grandparents would laugh at us that we cut the banks of the Chattahoochee to make a river, make a road flat. Knowing darn well what happened to the Chattahoochee. It runs over its banks. And when you build I-285 around the city of Atlanta and at the bank of every river, what did we do? Did we go up with the bridge? We went straight with the bridge. Who are the bridge builders in here? The potential future bridge builders. There must be one or two in the room. Okay. Go tell the potential future bridge builders. Honorary rule number one. When you come to a river, you build a bridge up. <laughs> if you build a bridge flat, it's going to be just like Atlanta. As soon as the water comes, what's going to happen? The debris is going to build up under the bridge, and it's going to do what? is going to flood the local terrain around the interstate. And it happens here all the time. It happens on the east side, and it happens on the west side. The dynamics of what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, you say, well, why do we do that? How do we let that happen? Well, the professors in the room will tell you what. Policy, big landowners, they wanted to exit there. They want to develop that land. And oh, by the way, it hadn't flooded here recently. That's the biggest lie ever told. It hadn't flooded here before. Well, ladies and gentlemen, anywhere you see red here is uh, subject to major flooding, as well as spots out in the Midwest. You got the Mississippi River. Uh, got its name from the Native Americans, American Indians. Uh, when you interpret the word Mississippi River in the, the language of the time, it, it means the father of the waters. Now, if you live next to the father of the waters, what do you ought to expect to happen? It's going to flood. 1927, go back to 1912, 1936, the evolution of uh, when we put our levee systems in around the Mississippi River, going all the way as far north up into uh, Missouri, uh, St. Louis, put that levee system in to keep the river from flooding. The great uh, plains are coming down the Mississippi Delta. What impacts that had? Well, it's had significant impact. It's created development all along. You'll see all many of our major great cities. One thing in common, you may not see it on this map, is that there's a river there. You can go to Austin. You can go to Fort Worth. Uh, because our ancestors, they chased water. Water was key not only for drinking, it was key for industrialization, and it was key for the biggest thing, transportation. 
And where the water was, the cities went. Where the cities went, the railroads went. You know the rest of the story. What happened in New Orleans? The city was underwater because the levees broke. Uh, it happened before, and it could happen again. You think about what happened in New Orleans with a population of about a half a million people. What do you think would happen in Miami? How many people live below a Daytona Beach in Florida, you imagine? How many people you imagine live there? About around 10 million. That infrastructure was built around 4 million. Uh, I've got two major roads that leave there. What prevents a Katrina from happening in Miami? Is there a, something out there that could prevent it from happening? Uh, go read about the flood, the storm of 1935, called Hemingway's Hurricane. It came through here at overtopped Key West. Uh, it drowned 200 veterans from World War I who was out there working on the railroad between Miami and Key West. <clears throat> Very tragic event. And you might say, well, why were those veterans there? They were on a project called the WPA, building a railroad for this uh, great uh, businessman and the collaboration with the state of, with the state of Florida putting uh, rail service into Key West. The storm was coming. They got the word the storm was coming. Uh, the governor of Florida said, we'll take care of the vets. The guy running the railroad said he would do it. Ended up, nobody did it. 200 of them drowned on barges right off the coast of Florida. So we have done stupid before. And we can go back into further gen uh, earlier generations where we have failed to act before disasters happen. In the case of New Orleans, we had an 80% evacuation of the city. 80% actually evacuated. The part you heard about was 60 or 70,000 that you saw unfold on television that didn't evacuate. But we've got to find a solution to that, right? And uh, the next piece I want to talk to you, go up to the piece on leadership, you'll see General Washington in the IBB. To you engineers, the IBB is an itty bitty boat. <laughs> and you got an admiral here today or coming, I'm sure uh, he'll appreciate that, maybe. But uh, three points of leadership we want to take from this uh, little portfolio. You probably know that story. The three points of leadership is, Washington was successful because he embraced doing the routine things well. And when he couldn't do it and impose it on his army, he brought other people in. Washington was successful because he wasn't afraid to take on the impossible. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, all the opportunities on the other side are impossible. When we go from 7 to 10 billion people, we're going to have to do the impossible. How many of you ever spent any time without electricity? Lights went out. We have put people on the moon. Right now, we got a vehicle the size of my Ford 150 pickup truck running around up there taking pictures. But we haven't developed a transformer that a damn squirrel can't trip. <laughs> we just be sitting in here right now, and uh, our friends from Georgia Power and Georgia Southern, all the hoo-ha they talk about, two squirrels will be out there getting ready for their homecoming game. Bam, knock the power out. And you got to wait till the truck come on, find out which pole it's on, and, you know, pull the dead squirrel off, and hit the thing, and it come back home. <laughs> there are many more threats to our power grid. I'll tell you that because power is the number one ingredient that define us in these disasters. And when we lose power, we lose the ability to communicate. We lose the ability to pump water. We lose the ability to flush toilets. We lose the ability to watch Anderson Cooper. You got me? It affects everything. So as Washington in his day wasn't afraid to take on the impossible, the defeat of the British Army, we've got to take the impossible on. Now, when I go to the schools in the South and I talk to them about the impossible, as I've been here before, talked about the impossible, Think about one of you students doing the impossible. We're not asking you to charge forth on the battlefield. We're talking about you solving the issues of the day when we go from 7 billion to 10 billion people because we're going to have power problems. The grid is vulnerable. 
you and your time, the students in this room today, you're going to have to find a solution to this. One of them is, think about five years ago, I used to go say, go to a big box store. But soccer moms don't have to go to the big box store anymore, right? They can go to their computer and order it off of Amazon, right? Or eBay. Order a little box this size. You take it home. And they said there's no engineers in the room, so y'all stay with me. You take it in a closet and you plug it in the wall. And you don't worry about it. If the power go out, it will run the house for five days. Now, when you tell that to the engineer students, what they tell you? That ain't going to work. Electricity don't work that way. It don't work. Why it don't work? Because we hadn't done it yet. But we don't have a choice. We've got to do it. Of the 7 billion people in the world today, about 2 billion of them, can't do this. They don't have electricity in their house. How do you think they feel when they wake up in the morning and they don't have electricity or they wake up in the middle of the night or the fact that they're going to kill a chicken today and they got to eat it all because they can't save it till tomorrow? How do you think they feel about that? And another billion and a half can't do this. They can't turn water on because they don't have water in their house. And of that seven billion people, three billion of them live on less than four dollars a day. This cup of coffee here, how much do you think that costs? How many of you burned through $4 before you even got to class? We've got to solve this problem. And it's got to be on your watch. We've got to figure out how to do this. Because when we get the world power, we won't be running power lines in the front of the house anymore. How many of you believe that? Think about a campus here when there's no power lines. Because some of you engineers are going to figure that out. How are we going to do this? Well, the fact that the squirrel goes away. Why don't worry about Mr. Squirrel turning the lights off. That's the impossible. We're going to have to do this. When you look at the number of people in the world today that don't have power, don't have plumbing, don't have electricity. And we sit here and say, well, boy, I wonder where the opportunity is going to be when I grow up. They're all right here. We got to do the impossible. Just like General Washington did the impossible and won our freedom from the British, to you lie this great burden to do the impossible. Think about what happened if you were to teach a computer how to taste and smell. And what do the computer people tell you? Well, that's impossible is what they tell me. They tell me, say, well, General, you don't understand how a computer works. A computer is about X's and O's. A computer can't smell. Only because what? We hadn't taught it. If we were to teach a computer how to taste and smell, think about going up here uh, where they're building the new airplanes. And uh, think about building an airplane for Delta, great Atlanta company, that tells the pilots on the way in here, uh, out, out from Atlanta, that the person sitting in F-15 seat has a fever. Pretty relevant to what's going on today, isn't it? And 30 minutes out, the computer said, not only does F-15 has a fever, 10 people around him have a fever. As he put his landing gear down, he get a message from the FAA, don't land in Atlanta, take that airplane to Shreveport. Plane lands in, in Shreveport, the flight attendants give everybody a little stick. This isn't invented yet either. Put it in your mouth. If you come out green, you get off the plane. If it comes out red, you stay on the plane and we ship you to Utah. <laughs> Dug way proven guys out there for further analysis. This isn't invented. This is the burden on you, big brain people. Y'all got to figure this shit out. You've got to solve these problems of an expanding global population inside this in-between football games. Now, y'all got to figure it out because we can get lost in the moment. We've got to solve these problems. Back in the day, General Washington solved the basic problem. He won our freedom, him and his veterans. 
the day we got to solve this problem associated with what? Going from 7 billion to 10 billion people. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the opportunities. And think of the airplane itself. How old is the airplane? How many years? 100 and what? Take a swag. 112. When it was first developed, how did they do it? Two old boys, they got some sticks, right? They got some cloth, tied all that together, went jump off a damn hill. And when they did it, what people say? Them boys are crazy. <laughs> if God wanted us to fly, what have you done? Give us some wings. Some of the stuff you're going to do to solve this, people are going to call you crazy. And if you're not a little bit crazy to do it because you're looking around the corner, you're solving problems. All the engineers will tell you, you can't plug something in the wall and run the house. We don't have an option. We will never get uh, high transmission power lines throughout Africa. But you know what? They can skip that. Because of some of you in this room will create a technology where they don't need it. Many people in the world, they skip what? They skip the hard line phone. They don't have it. How many of you have a hard line phone where you live? You, you know, you don't even want them. Then what is that? They skip it. The technology that's required for this new normal as we go from 7 to 10 billion people is not an option. We've got we've to prioritize these fixes, and power is one of them. Water is the other. We've got less clean drinking water today than we had yesterday. This is not about a political party. This is a reality. We're going to have less tomorrow than we got today. You buy into that? How many of you believe that? And there's probably some non-believers who say that ain't true. All you got to do is live in Georgia. If you've been here a while, you've been through the drought. You've been through the fact when the Chattahoochee was sucking mud, right? And we already got a water wars. I'm here to tell you, future wars will be over water, not oil. Participate in two of those. Future wars will be over. We got a water war going out in the Midwest. We got a water war going on in the West. And at the same time, we got a water war going on with the energy business. That's the dynamic of the new normal. Now, if you go to that culture of preparedness, if you would... Uh, the one that you were shooting through? Yeah, just open it right there. There is a solution. Uh, go ahead, open it up all the way. Faster, faster, there you go, faster. <laughs> faster. I think this man is going to make a good Marine. Go back. <laughs> Disaster happened. We have gotten pretty good on this side. All the governors know you got to have a news conference. Right? <laughs> you got to declare you're in charge. Right? And right behind you is your National Guard general, you understand, and your police guy, and your doctor, and uh, local university president. You know, you got to do the news conference. You got to state you are taking care of the people. Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting very good at this. My projection is we got to get over here. We got to get to the left side of the disaster. There are things that the engineers will tell you the most possible, the most probable, and the most dangerous. If you had time, which one would you work on? Y'all can answer that question later. Possible, probable, most dangerous. I tell people if you're short on time, do the most dangerous. Because when you go into that, you will work your way through some of these other issues that, because Going into a disaster without a plan is a problem. Going into a disaster with a plan that you're not willing to change is a bigger problem, because then you're stupid. Because the plans never survive contact with what? Reality. So you've got to adjust them along the way. It's like the CDC and the public health law dealing with Ebola. A little bit of that going on. Good people. Get to the left side. We are going to have to invest ourselves to say, hey, this is the most probable incidents. How do we prepare for them? Every dollar we spend here save $12 over here. Now, Professor, you'd be glad to know, I was asked by a uh, professor out of uh, George Washington, how did I come with that number? And I said that I'd given that speech for about three years. I said, well, 
Oh, somebody finally asked, how did I come up with that number? Uh, Nine dollars is what my number was. I said, I made it up. <laughs> Every dollar you spend on preparedness, back then I would say nine dollars. He said, I'm going to look at that, you know, I don't think you're right. And he came back a year later, he called me and said, hey, look, you were wrong. Because the actual is for every dollar you spend on this side of the disaster in preparing, you save $12 over here. So since then, I've had a point of reference given to me by a professor. <laughs> and what am I talking about? If you don't put the generator in the basement, you don't have to build a $1.3 billion dollar hospital for which you got to borrow the money from the Chinese to build. Y'all getting into me now? Because you get a little bit of finance here. You got it? Okay? We got to get to the left side of the disaster. If you do not clog up the river, the Chattahoochee and the tributaries, when the floods come, you're not going to do a major insurance payout for all these uh, small villages all around Georgia you've built in these valleys with all these houses against the uh, side of the, uh, the ridges, and when the flood comes, what happened? It takes them out. We got to get to the left side of the disasters, is what I project we're going to have to do. We're going to have to invest in preparedness. We're going to have to design, build, looking at most probable, most probable event, most dangerous event. What's the most dangerous event in Georgia? Some of you might have thought it might have been a nuclear power plant going bad. How old is the youngest nuclear power plant we got in Georgia that's active? They're close to 30 years old. How many of you drive a car that's that age? Good. <laughs> he lying. <laughs> he might be a professor, but he ain't driving no 30-year-old car to California. <laughs> yeah, he's a rambling reject from Georgia Tech. That's what he is. Well, there are exceptions. But... The point I'm getting to, to you that have an imagination with me, is that at what point in time did you know we published the life expectancy for a nuclear plant? Have you ever been told that? Have you ever been told the life expectancy of a pipeline? In Louisiana, we got 70,000 miles of pipeline. Much of it brings fuel to here to Atlanta. One of them is the Columbia pipeline being replaced now. That infrastructure is going to have to be replaced. What is the life expectancy of it? Because ladies and gentlemen, when we have a natural disaster, they can easily become what? A man-made disaster. There is much work for you to do in this century, is what I'm telling you. Much work. And much of it today is going to look like impossible. And as we go into this new normal, I've written two books. One of them, Leadership in the New Normal, the other one, Survival. Creating a culture of preparedness. Uh, if you get a chance, you can draw them down online, take a look at them. You don't have to buy them. You can borrow them or read them online. But I make points from this talk out of those two books. Because I do think the opportunities are there. The third point, if we went back to that picture of General Washington, of leadership that he displayed was, don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. So we had three points on leadership. Do the routine things well. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. And number three, uh, don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. Because the things that you're going to want to do, people will criticize for them. If you stand around now and say we got a pollution problem, that we got a problem with water, we got a problem with air, we got a problem with carbon and problem with benzene and methane getting into the air, what a lot of people will tell you, you're crazy. Ain't no such thing. Ain't no such problem. But the problems are real. We got less clean water today than we had yesterday. Now, a solution in the room might be what? How do we go out and clean that water up? If you look at, if you saw the map, was still up here in the Mississippi River. If you got down to the Mississippi River, there's an 800 square mile dead zone. That is man-made. And where does it come from? Everybody who dumps water and chemicals and fertilizer that end up in the Mississippi River. 800 square mile dead zone. That problem needs to be solved. How did they create it? At high level of phosphate and proteins get in the Mississippi River, 
He goes out there and he creates a super numo algae bloom taller than this building. And when that algae dies, guess what happens? It goes to the bottom, right? And it kills all the uh, plant life, animal life down there, fish life. And when it does that, it creates the dead zone. 800 square miles. That problem need to be solved. That problem need to be at the top of your damn list here at Georgia Tech. You got it? That problem with how we're going to solve this power issue need to be at the top of your damn list. Because we can't keep doing what we're doing to Mother Earth. We can't keep burning coal. We can't keep burning fossil fuel. We will destroy this earth. And the students in here, the opportunities on the other side are impossible. People will tell you it's impossible. But you're going to have to solve these problems. You're going to have to solve that problem with all those people that don't have clean water and can't do this, can't turn the electricity on. Because when people can't do that, what happened to people? They become disgruntled. And somebody come along and said, hey, we, we can take care of you. Let's go out here and we're going, to do a little, we're going to do a little social unrest. And the next thing you know is what? We're going to create our own country. And the next thing you know, if we don't, if we leave people and they can't take care of themselves, what happened? Things happen like Ebola. Countries rich in natural resources, but don't have hospitals, don't have a network, don't have a logistics system, don't have a communication system where they can take care of their people, and they can go from folklore to science, and making them understand that there are changes that need to be made. Y'all with me? All these things are tied together. And much of them can be solved in the engineering classrooms right here. Because engineering can solve a lot of this. A lot of things that be, work be left for the preachers, the theologians, and the Lawyers to work on, damn lawyers. You got any lawyers in the room? We'll have to solve out the issues associated with the have and the have not. So a lot of work for everybody, regardless of what discipline you're in. That is the challenge of leadership and preparedness in the 21st century. Are you with me? How about some discussion? Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. And in a place called the Valley, it flooded everything, all the businesses. Yes, sir. About 67 years later, the area is so sort of prime for business that they rebuilt everything that was there and built the levees a little bit bigger. So, how do you propose we actually, how do, you, how do we engage with these big businesses, these governments, to, to make these things sort of not happen anymore? Yeah, and it's probably going to flood again, too. Uh, levees, uh, the idea behind a levee is a good deal. And a levee gives you early warning, give you some protection. But it will not stop floods because they're vulnerable. They can be overtopped. Uh, the other thing that happened to a levee is somebody can go along and do what? And unplug the levee. And sometimes it's rodents. Just basic rodents, beavers, you know, other water foul type animals go, and they're hanging out. Oh, they put a nice fresh dirt up here. This is a nice place to go build a hooch. And they say, you know, the levee is compromised, and what happened? It can break. I do think it's a mistake. When I was a young boy riding around with my grandfather, we had a place in Louisiana not far from our uh, old rental farm, and I said, you know, we ought to buy that place, and I could put my 4-H projects there. We could raise hay there. And he said, boy, let me tell you something, 1927, there was 13 foot of water there. You go to that same place right now, and there are mega mansions there. It's just a function of time before they flood. And you can go to the old timers right around here in, Florida, in, in uh, Georgia, uh, inside the flood zone. And you see these places, you know, you know boy, they saved this property just for us. Uh, we know better. Uh, some of the biggest detriments to preparedness is planning zones. Planning and building uh, committees inside the counties. The dilemma you have here in Atlanta is you got several counties underneath this city, right? And you don't have a central government. 
And inside those counties, you have multiple cities. And that's the way people want it. I don't think people want to change. I do think sometime in the new, in the new normal, they're going to have to change. They'll have to do what New York did. You got one mayor, he's in charge. You got one police chief, one fire chief. Everything else is boroughs. People in Atlanta, they may not be ready for that. They might be taking another 100 years for them to be ready. But at some point in time, you mark it in history, it's going to have to happen. You can't continue to run this city the way it is with a decentralized, every uh, turn in the road got their own governor, I mean their own mayor, their own police chief, their only fire, their only fire chief. It ain't not going to work. It's a broke system. So the political science people in here, y'all need to start mapping that out, what it ought to look like. Because you're right in the middle of it, right here in Georgia Tech. It's come all around. You've got to figure out how we're going to solve that. And I hope that answered your question, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you suggest would be a better solution to a redundant problem such as the Lower Ninth Ward? Well, the Lower Ninth Ward is, uh, you remember Hurricane Gustav came three years after Katrina? Uh, the waters from Gustav, which did not make a direct hit on New Orleans, was uh, over tipping the levees we've got in the Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, one of the issues with the Lower Night War is that it became more vulnerable over two things. We got thousands of miles of oil and gas exploration canals that have been put into the wetlands. You know the wetlands, the biggest wetlands and uh, marshes in America right there in, in that area of Louisiana. Well, when they put the uh, exploration canals in, the uh, in exploring the oil and gas business and creating that, uh, guess what happened? Salt water came into the marsh. And when salt water comes into the marsh, we lose the uh, equivalency of the state of Delaware has been lost in the last 40 years. Uh, hurricanes come in, and the marsh does what? It eats up the energy of the hurricane. Just a quick class on that. I mean, there's probably a professor here that will spend a damn hour explaining what happened, but I mean, that's... <laughs> This is the airport uh, uh, answer, you know what I mean? It eats up the energy of the, well, we don't have that marsh anymore. But it's associated with a man-made event by leaving canals that bring salt water in directly into the wetlands. So the fact that, and then come along, we had a powerful senator uh, last decade. She insisted that they put a, a canal in called Mr. Go. So there wasn't a canal there. She said, we want to put Mr. Go in. And she was convinced by a lot of her Chamber of Commerce friends, if you put Mr. Go in, the ships would be able to get in the city quick. Actually, what they wanted was they wanted to develop that for hunting camps and resorts. So building and code committees went from that, a good idea of the Bubba's in the city, to develop this land by putting this canal in, that would be a shortcut class Barataria Bay going into the industrial canal, thereby cutting the shortcut, and they could develop the land. Y'all got it? That's how you ended up with the interstate system that don't make any sense that come through Atlanta. This was a political decision. Good engineers would have not designed this piece of shit to where it is. <laughs> it was done this way because of politicians who wanted to develop land. So that's the problem you young people are going to have to correct. In the case of the Ninth Ward, when they put Mr. Go in there, uh, the way it happened was the senator held up the promotion of all the Corps Engineer Generals and held up the Corps Engineer budget until they said, okay, if you want it, you're going to get it. Ships never used Mr. Go. Why? Because the ships would try to go down it and the ship captains would get in there, and the ships would just go crazy because of the current, the weird current that existed there. So it never got used, it never got developed. But it was a V-line for Katrina to get into the night ward. You got it? That's the quick answer.
So you said the night ward. The dilemma of the night ward was we had time to evacuate. You saw we picked the babies up on the street. We've got socioeconomic issues in New Orleans. When we picked those babies up on Friday, that's the first time I really got angry. I'd been there three days. Because the question to me was, how did these twin babies end up on the street, the mama by herself with no daddy? How did that happen? By then, I'd been in the Army 35 years. I kind of figured that out, but I, this, this really got me upset. We got to deal with that. Because when, you, when I went off and talked to the Children's Defense Fund, they explained this to me. They said, Gerald, those babies, they have a 50% chance by the time they're 14 to be dropouts from school. They're not going to get a fair break. That's a problem. So we've got socioeconomic issue, and we've got engineering issue, and we've got pollution issue. Because when we left those canals open, it deteriorated our wetlands. And this is not just Louisiana wetlands. This is your wetlands. You got it? And that has left that lower night wall still is susceptible to flooding. And that's a good, good point. But we are closing Mr. Go. We're going to spend your federal tax dollars to close Mr. Go. It was a bad idea from the beginning. It was a bad idea when it was done. And it's still a bad idea. And it overexposed the night ward. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I'm a survivor of Hurricane Katrina. And we used to talk about Hurricane Katrina being more than 40 years, that they could have planned to make some changes, especially with the levee. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the way that worked is we got the Corps engineers. Normally use the general pretty good outfit. They build stuff based on what politicians want, what they will pay for and what they'll approve. They build the projects and they turn them over the way our government work to local levy boards. In New Orleans, the levy boards were cronies of the governors. The New Orleans levy board literally was running a golf course. And they would take care of each other's yards. And they created hunting camps. Not for everybody to go to, for what? It was just a corrupt system. Since then, the citizens of New Orleans have created a competent levy board with engineers on it, hydrologists and you know, people who kind of know what they're doing. I think they know what to do now. But for a long time, that was overridden by political favors. It, it's not an excuse. I'm just telling you where it was. I was off in the Army. <laughs> and when I was in Louisiana, I wasn't invited to the room, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, that's a socioeconomic issue that, that caused that to happen. And we spent $14 billion. That city could still flood again. You ought to know that, too. Just like Atlanta can flood, parts of it can flood again. Yes, ma'am. All of the above. The mayor called for the evacuation of the city on Friday. The mayor, oh, by the way, is in jail now. He called for the evacuation. Now, tell me who ought to be in jail. You answer this question on your own. And who else should be with him, in other words. The mayor called for evacuation on Friday. The school board don't work for the mayor. The school board said, we got a Saints game tonight. He said, if we start evacuating, what are the people going to do with the children? Because the Saints organization said, hey, we're having a game. The storm ain't coming until Sunday. This is a preseason game. And all the hotel operators, what did they say? We got these tickets sold. This is a lot of economic activity. So a lot of people that could have left Friday didn't leave. 
There's the Saints game. It's coming on Friday night, preseason game. Saturday, 70 miles away in our state capital, guess who's playing football? LSU. And I'm convinced in the Southeast Conference, if you want to take this part of America, do it on opening football season, and the Russians could come in and take all this shit. Because <laughs> everybody with a brain is on their way to a game or at a game. So we had that paralysis of decision because people said, well, if the Saints playing football, why would I want to leave? We can get in our car and leave tomorrow. And the people at LSU said, well, we're going to have the game Saturday morning against uh, Backdoor State, you know, one of them throwaway games. You know, it's a practice game. We got to have the game, so they had the game. When you take the capital city and you fill it up with football uh, people, where do the people in New Orleans go? The storm is coming to New Orleans. They got to go to Memphis. They got to go to Jackson. That created a dilemma for the city of New Orleans. Then on Saturday, the president called. I was on the call. I was right here in Atlanta at Fort Gillum. That's my job, to respond to the storm. President of the United States is on the phone. He's talking to my boss. Keating in Colorado, he started in the Pentagon, they're all on and said, hey, he said, I got a call from the, the uh, director of the Hurricane Center, he said, this thing is coming, and it's coming strong, and it's coming somewhere in the Gulf, we knew that Saturday, and he said, it looked like it's coming to Louisiana, we're going to declare a national a disaster right now, declaration, a presidential declaration, first time it had been done, in modern time, natural, in, in presidential declaration, happened on Friday, Saturday. Sunday, you know the rest of the story, right? People with cars left. We end up with 60 to 70,000 people in the city. Many of them went to resorts of the last. If you are poor, how much money you got on the 29th of the month? So how do you get out of town? That's a part of the dilemma we ended up with. So a lot of these are socioeconomic issues, but they can go back to, since you're in engineering school, the engineering problems. Then they go to what? Economic problems. Because they had that game because of economics. Got it? These are the dilemmas. These are the problems y'all got to solve. There's a lot of work for you to do. All the people, professors that told you all the good stuff is done, they're wrong. There's a lot of good stuff for all you students who work on in this new normal because you got to solve these problems. You got to solve these problems with energy. You got to solve these problems with water. You have to solve these problems with the availability of technology. There's so much to be done. Okay, the elephant in the room is Ebola. What went wrong? Things have been around a long time. Oh, one of the things is we got caught uh, and we weren't ready. Just like Katrina came to Louisiana and they weren't ready. You saw the storm come all the way out of, uh, Katrina went through Cuba as a category three. Killed 18 people. It came to Louisiana and Mississippi and killed over 1,800. And that's a poor country. How did that happen? These are the issues of the time that y'all gonna have to deal with. And again, people didn't evacuate because the former government is the mayor can't tell the school board what to do. And the school board chasing the saints. And LSU, our flagship institution, they were about opening the season of football. So by Sunday night, the storm is bearing down on the city, and you got the close to 60,000, 70,000 people uh, that didn't get out of the city, many of them poor people. I can say this, the majority of people that we found dead were elderly, disabled, and poor, sometimes all three of the 1,800 people that died. So it speaks to the fact that the vulnerable population, the houses are not as well uh, structurally sound, and they're more apt to live in a flood zone. And when the time to come for them to leave, they can't leave. Uh, two points for you to take with you. Take away. In the middle of a disaster, be prepared to figure out what rules you're going to break. If you now write anything else down, write that down. In the middle of a disaster, figure out what rules you're going to break. I'll give you two quick examples that I know it's about time for you to go. Number one, the example I'll give you is... Uh, Airport, New Orleans. We get the airport open on Saturday morning. Remember the storm came Monday morning. We get it open Saturday morning. United States Transportation Command is sending airplanes in. 
Uh, this is a sight to see, all these big wide-body planes coming in. Uh, TSA out of Atlanta shipped a lot of TSA people in. We got the National Guard bring the people to the airport, the New Orleans airport. They get there an hour into getting people on the airplane. We're getting them on. It's a great sight to see. I'm getting pictures on my Blackberry. I mean, this thing is happening. I get a call from my major, Major Parks. He lives here in Atlanta. He said, boss, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the TSA people say uh, they can't handle all these people. You're going to have to bring some more TSA screeners in with some more wands. They can't handle a load. I said, well, okay, well, let me talk to them. I was about to get on my helicopter and fly into New Orleans. I, I was over in Mississippi. And so he said, okay. So he got him in the room. I said, uh, put him on the speakerphone, the Blackberry. So the guy said, uh, I'm agent so-and-so from the TSA general. We're here to help you. But well, we just don't have the capacity. You know you're about to hear some dumb shit. <laughs> when you hear somebody in the government say the word capacity, it's like on their checklist. So I said, well, what is the problem? What do you mean you don't have the capacity? He said, well, we need more people. We need more wands. There's too many people up for us to check. I said, well, let's get back to the fact of why you're checking these people. They're poor. They've been standing around the Superdome and on bridges for almost seven days. What are you talking about? I said, let me tell you something, Mr. Agent. Osama bin Laden is not in New Orleans. <laughs> I was here when we dreamed up this dumb shit. You understand? Osama bin Laden is not in New Orleans. I can assure you that. We putting these people on the plane. Do you understand? And his little boy, boy, she said, okay. <laughs> we load. You imagine how stupid this nation would have looked if we didn't load these people on the airplane? And I'm telling you, in the middle of every disaster, we come out with that damn checklist. Or something about the law said you can't do this. When did we create that law? Some of you remember when you got on the plane, you got your ticket, you walked on the plane. That was it. Now all of a sudden, we got rules. The next disaster happened about two hours later. That group of airplanes took off. We get the pilots who had spent the night before in some five-star hotel someplace. They're walking through the airport. My colonel called me because he see them walking down, and they're looking for who's in charge. So they find this colonel standing right next to my major. And the guy said, uh, we need to know who's running this. And the colonel said, well, I guess I'm here representing First Army, General Honoré. The guy said, okay. We got a problem. He said, the, last, the first group of airplanes took off. They didn't have a manifest. And the FAA requires us to have a manifest. <laughs> so the colonel called me. I said, you know the routine. Take him in the room. Get the Blackberry on. Turn the speaker on. So the guy introduced himself, Captain Evans, had spent flu C-141, you know, and C-130. Great guy. And then he get down there and said, well, we can't take off, General. I said, those last airplane took off without no manifest. FAA rules it, we got to have a manifest. I said, well, where do you think we're going to get a manifest from? And I described him, you want us to pull them from? <laughs> These people don't have any identification. Hello. They were run out of the house in the middle of the night. Some of them didn't have identification before the storm. And we're going to tell them in America they can't get on the plane because you can't create. I cannot create a manifest. You can give me 24 hours and I can't make a manifest. He said, well, that's a real problem. I said, you know what, Captain, it is. But it's a problem for you. Because we got guns and you don't. <laughs> We're loading these goddamn airplanes. <laughs> and the little boy voice came out, okay. <laughs> you take responsibility. I said, I do. And I uh, leading over to my lawyer. I said, call them in Washington. Tell them what's happening. Because this will be on CNN too, you know. <laughs> we loaded those airplanes. What I'm telling you is in the middle of a disaster, somebody's going to bring some stupid law up. It's like the stupid law. Who's in charge of the road going through in Atlanta? They can't tell you. 
the politicians, they're off giving each other awards. They don't damn know. You understand what I'm saying, folks? We got to fix that. So to these young people in the room, there's a lot of work for you to do. Regardless of what discipline you're going to be in, there's a lot of stuff that need to be fixed. We are, we are far from a perfect world. And all of that create opportunities for you. And I hope you will take advantage of those opportunities and solve some of these issues. There's, we, the, the greatest generation left a lot of work for you to do. The boomers continue to create a work for you. Because we want bigger cars with less gas mileage. You understand? We create work for you to solve. Whether you look at it from a medical perspective, disasters, from the amount of energy we use and the impact that have, to uh, how we've engineered our cities, uh, you've got a lot of problems to fix. And I hope your professors, they, they, they will guide you through that. Because you've got to fix these problems. And it's not an option. Because when we fix them in this country, we'll, it'll be a, a lead to fix it in other countries. And this Ebola thing, it's a Katrina, and I don't mean that to talk administration, but it's a thing that has happened that at the source of it, that we're losing the war. And we're losing the war over the last three weeks of arguing over dumb shit here in the United States. You understand, like the Texas debacle. They weren't ready. As opposed to saying they weren't ready, they tried to say, well, you know, we Texas. We're doing what the CDC is saying. You know what I'm saying? Then the CDC, they jumped in this role that they're going to go out and jump on grenades. It's not their job. The CDC ought to be doing the policy and the prevention and making sure we got the vaccinations being engineered. Their job is not to go jump on grenades. And you can just see it happening. Pre-9-11, we did exercises every six months on pandemic, epidemics, and bioterrorism. 9-11 happened, and what did our national focus became? Counterterrorism. And that's where the money went. We spent $60 billion a year in Homeland Security. $60 billion. So there's a lot of work for you all to do. And a lot of these solutions can come right out of this great institution. Because I do think y'all put academics before football. God bless you. <laughs>